Howdy everybody. Um, this is a tool cart I've been using for a couple years now. Um, it has basically all the tools that I use for probably, you know, at least 95% of the like kind of van tasks I got to do when I'm building a van, you know, from attaching things like wall panels and cabinets uh, to all my plumbing tasks, to all my electrical tasks. I basically have all of them on this cart here. And that, I mean, has like literally saved me miles and miles of walking across the shop. I purposely built it, you know, kind of higher up like this so I can access the things when I'm standing on the ground. But if I've got a kind of a lengthy task I'm doing in the van, I can just go ahead and roll this up to the door and then I can just reach right out and grab all the tools I might need. So I decided to make a tool recommendation video. And I know there's quite a few videos on the internet already about tools related to building vans, but I hope if you stick through this video to see that some of these tools I'm recommending are a lot more kind of niche and uh, just like a much kind of deeper and more specific purpose to them. A lot of this is based on the videos I've already made. There's some specific tools I use in those tasks to make them a lot easier, but uh, there was just too much information going into those and I just couldn't kind of slow down and just kind of highlight those tools in that moment. So I'm gonna go back today and just point out a few things. We're gonna cover about 10-ish total tools today. Um, most of them will be on this cart, but before we start here, we're actually gonna head over to the table saw where I'd like to uh, just kind of point out a couple things that help me every single day I'm woodworking in the shop. All right, so coming through the shop, you know, this is uh, basically kind of the heart of my all my woodworking. I'm very much a table saw based woodworker. Um, most of the functions or most of the processes I think of really revolve around, you know, starting all my sheet good breakdown, all my small parts cutting at the table saw. So the first thing I'd like to point out is I've got a little tool cart here and in it, I've got all the saw blades I use that live in here. And the one you don't see here is the one that I use for all my plywood cutting in my vans. And that is this Freud blade that's called their ultimate plywood and melamine blade. This thing costs right about as much as a nice sheet of plywood these days. If you have a table saw that can run a full curve blade like I am here, um, this is a 1 8 inch thick blade. This thing comes in just under $100. And if you want a thin curve blade, I believe they're right about 75 right now. I actually use the uh, thin curve blade as well. Uh, just that ability to remove less stock when I'm trying to do like continuous grain projects, I really like to be able to uh, not hog out a whole eighth inch, but just a little bit less. That's that 3 30 seconds of an inch with that thickness. Like if you look at these two examples here, this thing is missing a couple of teeth at this point, or it's got a couple of teeth chipped at this point. So it could use a resharpening or it could just use a replacement. And it continues to provide me essentially flawless cuts, even in its current state. Plywood is really expensive these days. So using a blade that just has perfect cuts, I think is 100% worth its money. And then looking back in my cabinet here, the second blade I would 100% recommend is a combination blade. And I know you're gonna probably say, hey, that's exactly what came with my table saw. Um, and I've even got a forest, you know, kind of combination dual purpose blade here. The saw stop blade that came, this was a general purpose. But I would really recommend you look for is right here. You can see this is saying it has a combination tooth, which means essentially it's got a flat tooth grind. Now this is critical if you wanna do some kind of plywood joinery that actually has uh, thin panels. So you can kind of make grooves, like imagine the way you do the bottom of a drawer, but you can use this for entire panels. And by having that flat tooth grind, it just makes cuts that have a perfectly flat bottom. So you don't have to deal with any unevenness that can make you know clamping things together pretty unpredictable. So the two blades I would 100% recommend is the plywood blade to just save yourself a bunch of frustration and cleanup work. And then a combination blade like this one, I think they are pretty critical if you want to make strong joinery and then just not be frustrated in the woodwork you're doing. But the other thing I 100% recommend is getting a better miter gauge. This is a miter gauge that I use every single day to cut all the tiny pieces that I use to make my uh, cabinets. The thing to make these lightweight cabinets is not any kind of crazy advanced technique. It's just being able to make small, precise pieces and just keep track of them. And this thing I use all the time. You know, I have a bigger crosscut sled over here if I need to cut something kind of large, but honestly, 99% of the time I use this thing. The ability to just have one of these sacrificial fences so you can just hold the piece and really just like sneak up on a perfect fit by just taking off, you know, a quarter of a hair at a time. Get yourself a nice miter gauge. 
This one from Incra has always served me well. You know, my table saw came with a miter gauge, this saw stop one, but all the miter gauges I've ever seen actually come with a table saw. You know, if you get them set right, they work well, but you know, you go to mess around with the angle because you want to make an angled cut and you put it back. And from my experience, they just don't hold their setting very well. While this thing, you know, many times a day, I will change what angle I need to cut. And then when I want to reposition it back to zero degrees, this thing comes back reliably. So I can't recommend this gauge enough. You can make a nice fancy, like kind of sacrificial fence here. For me, I just screw on any kind of wood piece I have laying around. Get yourself a good miter gauge and it will go a long ways dealing with all the small pieces that are used in a van build. All right, and now we're heading back to the tool cart. And the first thing I'd like to identify that I use every day is a little bit holder um, like this. And let's just quickly go over what I have in it and why I prefer this to some kind of like pre-made kit you can buy. All right, so this is just like a little plastic rubber little bit holder and there's nothing special about it. But what I prefer to some kind of like pre-made kit you can buy is that I can just house here exactly what I want and I don't have to deal with what's probably, you know, 50% Phillips bits that came in the set a couple Torx bits for like popular construction screws, and then, you know, either stuff I don't need or just not having what I need. So in my van, I essentially fasten all my furniture with some M6 button head screws. So this little hex bit right here gets used for all of those. And then for any kind of wood screws I need, I love square drive. So I've just got some square drive bits here so I can identify that. Working on a sprinter, the entire thing is essentially assembled using Torx bits. So I've just got a great assortment of little Torx bits here so I can quickly identify these. And if I'm missing one, you know, it just sticks out like a sore thumb because they all got their position. Since I did have a little more room, I got one straight bit here. And then I do have some Phillips bits because it's inevitable you're gonna have to use those. And then these are my metric hex bits and these are my standard hex bits or SAE bits. And with this, visually, I can just very quickly tell if something is missing and this only has exactly what I need, so I'm not, you know, left basically sorting through some, you know, tool analyst's decision of what is the most popular fastener in America. And to go along with this bit set, you know, what do you use to essentially drive these bits? And for me, there's four tools I'd like to highlight that I use every single day. Up first are two you're probably familiar with or you've seen before, and that is just some quarter inch just bit drivers. Um, the two I use most frequently are this tiny little stubby one by Weha. Um, it just helps get into tight spots. You know, it's like the shortest kind of screwdriver kind of form factor you can have. And then I just use this kind of standard length one by Baco. Um, Baco has been, for about the last year, if I got to buy a new screwdriver or like driving tool, this has become my favorite kind of handle design I found. Uh, there are maybe marginally more expensive, but you know, not as expensive as like a snap-on or anything, but so if I have an excuse to buy one, I buy Baco. And then I got two more tools that you may have not seen before. Up first is this tiny little Mac Tools quarter inch driver. Now this thing has a double pivot head that is just super useful for getting into spots. You know, if, you, if this was fixed, then anytime you'd be using it, it'd be kind of a knuckle basher and they could put it at an angle, but then you're kind of restricted to what angle they've decided. This thing helps, you know, you can offset it like this. Sometimes I'll actually flip it all the way around and then that way I can essentially get my hand right in axis with this thing and press down. Um, the ratcheting action on it is just fantastic. It's reversible. I love this tool. This is just a great little, almost I would say present if you wanted to buy someone something small they probably don't have in their tool bag but I find to be super useful. If anyone at Mac Tools watches this, what I would absolutely kill for is a version of this that has a single pivot. If you could just have the exact same handle here, but just a single pivot, that would also be great use to me because there are times when this double pivot design is almost, uh, you know, has too much maneuverability and you wish you could just go with a single. But I absolutely love this tool. Not recommended for like super high torque applications, but you know, if you kind of think about all the stuff you're doing in a van between like fastening furniture to maybe like taking off some of the factory trim, or you know, installing your wall panels, almost none of those tasks require you to use like a full ratchet set. So I just think tools like this provide like just enough torque and like the maneuverability, the delicateness for almost all van tasks. 
And the fourth tool I'd like to point out today is this little electric screwdriver by Dremel. Now this, I wasn't sure if it would turn out to be pretty hokey, um, but I've actually turned out to really like it. You know, it has a reverse or a forward function. And the way it works essentially is when you, you know, you hold this and then if you put pressure down to like drive a bit, it starts to turn. Same thing you can do to back them out. So, you know, you can just install any bit you want in the end here. And I have come to use this lots because the way I build vans is I do a lot of test fitting. So if I've got a wall panel that's got 10 or 12 fasteners, using this to just back them all out is just, you know, really helps reduce like wrist fatigue or anything. And so I have come to really like this tool. There are negative reviews about it, but I think a lot of them are honestly based because people are expecting this to take the place of like an impact driver. And, you know, just the fact that this is the form factor you're not gonna be able to get as much torque on it as you can on kind of like the pistol grip of an impact driver. So again, all of these not designed for high torque applications, but on kind of like the delicate, meticulous work of vans. All four of these I use every day and I highly recommend them. All right, up next, I'd like to recommend like the one tool I recommend people buy. If you're not very familiar with wiring, you don't wanna make a big investment, but you do wanna get reliable like wiring connectors and crimp connectors. So I think I've got essentially uh, four different crimpers down here that I use quite often. And then the one that's my go-to is this Nipex tool. But if someone just wants one tool to do everything, kind of like the adjustable wrench, you know, of crescent wrenches, I recommend a pair of lineman pliers like this one that I've got here that's actually made by Southwire. Now what's more important than the brand or anything with these lineman's pliers is to look for a little one that's got a crimper in it. And this is not the most you know, maneuverable tool. It's pretty cumbersome because this is on the end here. So once you make a wire connection, you've got a wire running through, you gotta like feed it out. But this, the ability of this thing to crimp almost any connector you'll find from you know, like 10 to 22 gauge connectors is better and more versatile than any other tool I've seen. And what you wanna look for is something that's got kind of a two lobed crimper like this thing. Now, a lot of those like regular, you know, like uh, do it all crimping and stripping tools, they will come with a single lobe connector. Not only does that not provide nearly the same kind of crimp strength as you can get out of one of these double lobed ones, it also has a chance of damaging the insulation, which, you know, obviously could, you know, cause some kind of shorting depending, you know, where that is or if it rubs up on any metal. But the amount of strength you get out of this is just incredible. All right, and let's just do a little example, right? So here we got a little piece of 18 gauge wire, which you would usually want one of the red colored connectors. And we've got a yellow connector, which is, uh, you know, 10 to 12 gauge. So this is, you know, hot dog in the hallway thing here, you know, like this uh, can almost shoot all the way through this connector. But just to show you like this thing, in my experience, can just essentially crush down almost any connector and make a secure connection. Not recommended. I mean, clearly if someone is doing this in a van, it points to either laziness, but you know, here we go, we've connected it. And this is where you see it's a little cumbersome is because if this was a continuous wire, you'd have to work it around. But now we've got a connection. And if we try to pull that apart, oh man, yep, that one is secure. And that is using a super undersized wire that is definitely not a recommended combination here, but I just wanted to demonstrate how well I find that this thing can crimp. And this is just an example of one of like the do-it-all wiring tools you'll probably pick up or even start out with, or might even just have one already bouncing around in your tool bag. You will see that it is labeled non-insulated and insulated for where you are supposed to crimp. But I do see tons of people using this single lobed crimping device um, and that is where you can actually damage the, sh you know, the insulation on the connectors using just that single point I have found. And you can get a good connection here, but it is a lot more finicky. While I have found with a pair of lineman pliers like this with that double lobe, essentially anything you put in here, you can reef down on and make a strong connection. So one crimp tool that I highly recommend for some strong connections. All right, so moving around to the side of the tool cart, We've got a heat gun. And I know you're gonna say, wow, that's uh, not a very original idea. I've seen tons of heat guns. But the thing I'd like to point out is this reducer on the tip um, that's kind of been a game changer for me. 
All right, so I like to use heat guns and vans for primarily two functions. Uh, the first is wiring, but the other one I like to use it on is actually a lot of plumbing tasks. If you've got some kind of stubborn, either, you know, if you've got a stubborn barb fitting and like a piece of tubing that's a little undersized, you know, sometimes that happens if you're getting some European parts where you've got a metric hose or a metric barb fitting, um, things can just be pretty tight. So applying a little heat to that tubing usually will soften it up and uh, just make it much less of a frustrating knuckle buster. But you know, the primary task is really for me dealing electrical parts. I use a lot of heat shrink or, you know, like crimp connectors like this that have a heat shrink jacket that you can shrink down. All right, so one kind of connector I really like to use on, you know, smaller gauge wire, maybe like 22 to 24 gauge, is these heat shrink connectors that have a little solder bubble in them. And essentially then, if you run your wire from both sides, it makes a butt connector, but it actually relies on this, you know, low temperature solder to melt. And as a result, just make a really nice connection, you know, without actually having to go through the task of soldering a small wire. If you use a regular heat gun tip like this and you're waiting for that solder bubble to melt, it can be pretty easy to accidentally damage or burn the jacket or the wire to the sides of it. Like if you look at this connection now, you know, that solder bubble has melted. This is a nice, you know, reliable connection, but we have damaged the jacket or the wire here just outside of the range of this heat shrink because essentially, you know, we were just too wide of kind of a heat window. So by using the much narrower kind of heat that comes out of a, the reducer like this, it just helps to eliminate any kind of damage to the wire when using small connectors like this. So these reducers, I just find them really handy. And then, you know, if you're wiring in the back of like an electrical enclosure, it just helps you to not be just blasting heat everywhere. So I can't recommend this enough. It's less than $10 for this little reducer. If you've got a Wagner or heat gun already, it fits most of them. And if you don't have a heat gun at all, then you can get this heat gun with like a kit of a few different tips for less than 30 bucks, which is a pretty good deal. So that's just a nice little helpful thing if you're doing specifically electrical work. All right, and one last trip to the tool cart. The last thing I'd like to point out today is just a regular scratch all like this. Um, I've used this a surprising amount and I specifically really like this all metal one. Uh, let me show you two functions that I use it for other than what everyone thinks of, which is like, you know, if you've got some wood, you can use it to essentially mark the start of a drill location. All right, so up first, I got a, you know, uh, a kind of a divider curtain that will come across here. And I'll usually put my rib nuts in first and then I'll carpet over it or a fabric over it. And like right here, when they're first all covered over, a good way to kind of spread that fabric I find is this thing just helps to find the holes and then you can just kind of move it around and it will just do a nice job kind of spreading the fabric so you can actually get your fasteners in through there. You know, when the covered holes aren't on the van itself, like on this wall panel, if you imagine every single one of these screw holes, when this panel was finished but laying on the bench, you know, I had pre-drilled all these holes because they were going to be used to attach it to the wall. So then a scratch all like this, I think is maybe the easiest tool to just like go through there and kind of work that fabric around so you can end up getting your fasteners through. So that is the first thing I use this for. And the second thing I use it for is an alignment tool. If you've got a big piece of furniture or like a wall panel that you're just trying to nudge into place and it might be a tight fit because there's other things next to it, this has been the best tool I have found to kind of lever the holes over and get them aligned perfectly. You can do this by trying to muscle the cabinet, but this just feels like a much more controlled method so that you can really just insert this into the hole and then just like lever it over and it moves the whole piece of furniture or the whole wall panel to get that alignment just perfectly. All right, so this is actually the last tool I'd like to point out today. If you buy one of these new, this will come all painted in blue. And I do recommend you kind of scuff or sand that off because it will leave blue residue over everything you um, insert it into. But I'm just surprised how often I use this. It's my favorite alignment tool when you're trying to just get your furniture placed in or your wall panels inserted. So with that, you know, that goes back in the tool cart. And um, yeah, hopefully you found at least some of those useful or interesting. And uh, thanks so much for watching, guys.